Hi everyone, I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince, and welcome back to Mustang Prince Oro Reports. Well, I'm glad to finally get my show back online again after such a long vacation to Washington, D.C. It was such a great adventure for me to experience this on my own without my family. So, with this month being September, which is actually my birth month, what better way to start things off than with, well, a dinosaur film? Now, there are many great films that involve dinosaurs. Some that are live action, like Steven Spielberg's fantastic film Jurassic Park. Or animated ones, like We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. Or Disney's Dinosaur. I don't care what any of you guys say. I thought it was interesting. However, the movie I'm going to be blogging today, not only is it praised by a lot of dinosaur fans, but it also puts these awful dinosaur films to shame. Released on November 18th, 1988, the movie is The Land Before Time. Now let's get started. After losing his mother during a sharp tooth, aka Tyrannosaurus Rex attack, and getting separated from his grandparents in a huge earthquake, an orphan brontosaurus named Littlefoot sets off in search of the legendary Great Valley, a land of lush vegetation where the dinosaurs can thrive and live in peace. Along the way, he meets four other young dinosaurs, each one a different species, like a Triceratops, a Sol uh, Sar... <sighs> Sauralophus, Pteranodon, and a Stegosaurus, and they encounter several obstacles as they learn to work together in order to survive. So, what did I think of this movie? Well, I loved it when I was a child, and I still love it now. But some parts can be a bit tear-jerking and dark at times. So, as to explain why, I'll tell you in Mustang Notes. The movie was directed by ex-Disney animator Don Bluth, who worked on such beloved films like The Secret of Nim, American Tale, and All Dogs Go to Heaven. During production of American Tale, Talk began with the next feature, with, with film legend Steven Spielberg. Spielberg wanted to do a film similar to Bambi, but only with dinosaurs. An early working title for the film was The Land Before Time Began. Like, Steven Spielberg, along with Star Wars director George Lucas, originally wanted to film the film to have no dialogue, like Disney's The Rise of Spring from Fantasia. But the idea was abandoned in favor of using voice actors in order to make it appealing to children. The film was originally planned for a release in the fall of 1987, but the production and the release dates was, were delayed by a year due to the relocation of Sullivan Bluth Studios in Dublin, Ireland. The production was preceded by extensive research, wherein researchers visited natural history museums in New York and Los Angeles, along with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., where I recently visited. The artist had to create a credibility landscape with animals. Animators made more than 600 background images for the film. However, Throughout production, The Land Before Time underwent a severe cutting and editing of footage. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas thought that some scenes in the film would appear too dark and intense for young children. Spielberg told Bluth while looking at the scenes from the film, he said, It's too scary. We'll have kids crying in the lobby and a lot of angry parents. You don't want that. About 11 minutes of footage and a total of 19 fully animated scenes were cut from the final film to attain a G rating, instead of a PG rating. Much of the cut footage consisted of the Tyrannosaurus attack sequence, 
and sequences of the five young dinosaurs in grave danger and distress. Some screams were revoiced using milder exclamations. Though Don Bluth was unhappy with some of the cuts and fought for all the footage, he had to settle on a final running time of 69 minutes, one of his shortest films. The sequence of Littlefoot's mother's death was shown to psychologists who gave their feedback to the production team, and the character of Reuter was added to the story to soften the emotion blow. Brief portions of the scene which showed the mother's neck and back bitten have since have been edited out of home video releases and television airings. Though this footage was present, present both in the theatrical cut and earlier VHS copies of the film. While there aren't that many songs throughout the film, the end credits song, If We Hold On Together, was sung by the, the great Diana Ross. Her song was re released as a single in January 1989. And to be honest, in my opinion, that song always makes me want to cry from how beautiful it sounds. Trust me. It'll make you cry, too. Now it's time to move on to voices. Now, our main character, Littlefoot, is voiced by Gabriel Damon. Whom I only remember was in a... Who I remember after this film was a lead character in another animated film. But I'll get into that this October. However, Lofu was originally going to be called Thunderfoot until it was found out about that Triceratops in a children's book already had that name. Anyway, my thoughts about Lofoot while he travels to the Great Valley to find his grandparents. He's guided by the angel of his mother, who tells Littlefoot direction to find the Great Valley via, a, well, via a tree star that she sent to him. Sarah is voiced by Candace Hudson, whom I all only know as Matilda Mouse from the Rita Rabbit games. It was George Lucas' idea to make Sarah a female Triceratops. When she was in mid animation as a male, she was named Bambo. <laughs> While Sarah may be a tough character, the thing I really don't like about her is her stubbornness and racist behavior. But in all honesty, I think she's just okay. I mean, not great, just okay. Next up is my one of my favorite characters, Ducky, who is voiced by the late Judith Barcy, who is in Jaws for the Revenge and All Dogs Go to Heaven. And before anyone asks, yes, I know how she died. When All Dogs Go to Heaven was almost done, being completed. Judith, along with her mother, were killed by her mentally ill Mr. Barcy. <sighs> such a disappointment when I found out about that, because she was such an adorable actress, and she was only ten when she died. Anyway, I just adoringly love Ducky, especially when she goes yep yep yep. <laughs> My second favorite character, Petrie, is voiced by Will Ryan, who voiced Digit the Cockroach in the American Tale. I like Petrie as much as I love Ducky. Mostly throughout this film, the reason why Petrie can't fly is because he's probably because of his age. It's like he's too little to fly. But however, a lot of times, every time Petrie's on screen, he always makes me laugh. <laughs> Especially some of his improper English, too. Uh, 
Unfortunately, Spike, the Stegosaurus, is a silent character and has no voice actor. But that's what makes him unique. Kind of like Dopey from Snow White. However, the character of Spike was inspired by Don Bluth's pet Chow Chow dog named Cubby. Even if Spike cannot talk and has a big appetite, I still think from watching him that he is still a smart Spike tail. And he's also lucky to have Dougie for his sister at the end of the film. Now, lastly, Sharptooth, who might think his noises are done by Frank Welker, is the villain of the film. He's also, in my eyes, the scariest character in the film, next to this Tar Beast. Shark Tooth is even scary as the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, and the Carnotaur from, from Dinosaur. How for me, there are like a few scenes where Shark Tooth is at his scariest. One, his fight with Littlefoot's mother in which he jumps on her back and bites her neck. Two, the scene where he's unconscious and then he wakes up while Sarah beats him up. And three, when he nearly steps on Littlefoot and his friends, but only to step on the tree star, destroying it on impact. But the part where Ducky was used for bait to lure Sharptooth into a trap was scary as well. But that whole scene was so awesome, it really did lead Sharptooth into an epic villain death. Sorry, I just wanted to try that quote myself. Now for my final word to this film. Above all, The Land Before Time in my eyes is one of Don Bluth's best ever made. It's scary, it's tear-jerking, and a lot of parts are able to give you and your child a smile. If you guys love dinosaurs, or if you like some of Don Bluth's original films from the 80s, or even a few films afterwards, then, give, then by all means, give this film a watch, and you'll all love it. So, what am I going to rate this film? Hmm. Ah, oh, heck with it. I'll give it 100%. However, with The Land Before Time completed, it wasn't truly the end of the story. Because, after this film, it generated 12 direct-to-video sequels throughout the 90s and the mid-2000s. They differ from the original by adding sing-along musical numbers akin to Disney's animated films. Blues and his animation studio had no affiliation with any of those sequels. The sequels have generally been met with mixed reception with several fans of the original disregarding the sequels, while others have embraced the sequels into a can of the story. And as for my thoughts on each of them, I mean, I think some of them are okay. And some of them are not as good as, as the first film. But however, I did happen to stop at number 10, which I might talk about some other time. And I did happen to include number 8 on my top 25 holiday films just a few months ago. Also, in 2007, a TV series was released in North America which, which follows the styles of the sequels in terms of the morality and the musical numbers, with some of them being shortened, reworked on of songs from the sequels as well. Well, that's all for today, everybody. So, be sure to join me next time as I move away from the prehistoric eras of Don Bluth's history and move on to the happiest place on Earth where I talk about one of my favorite extinct attractions. See you next time, everybody. Mustang Power!